Since 2016, Conversations at the Washington Library has explored the intricacies of George Washington's world through over 200 conversations with scholars. We've taken you, the listener, to the front lines of the American Revolution, traveled to Scotland and Spain through Washington's global connections, and confronted the difficult history of Washington's role in enslaving over 500 African Americans. Many at the George Washington Presidential Library have hosted conversations over the years, including Joe Stoltz, Kevin Butterfield, Doug Bradburn, Samantha Snyder, Jesse McLeod, Anthony King, and Allison Wickens. But for the last 109 episodes, it has been Dr. James M. Buskey who has become the familiar voice of conversations. As Conversations closes to its final episode, we're chatting with Dr. Mbuskey about the surprising journey Conversations has taken him during his years at Mount Vernon. From his favorite guests to his proudest moments, Jim tells all. And when one conversation ends, another can begin. When it comes to early American podcasting, Dr. Mbuskey and the team at the Center for Digital History at the George Washington Presidential Library still have some surprises in store. Welcome to Conversations at the Washington Library. I'm Anne Fertig, and joining me today is... Dr. Alexandra Montgomery. Today, we are going to interview the late, the great, Dr. Jim and Buskey. Yes, that's right. This is a very special final episode of Conversations at the Washington Library. We are moving on to other things, but we wanted to make sure that this tremendous podcast that Jim built into such a wonderful space for conversations about history can have the send off it deserves. So thank you for joining us today, Jim. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here to do a postmortem. We won't roast you too hard for leaving us today. At least I won't. I make no guarantees. <laughs> yes, just so everyone who's listening knows, Jim did leave us for another, for greener pastures, for a different opportunity, which is why he is no longer the host of this podcast. And we were very sad to see him go, although we will talk a little bit more later about the exciting things that he is doing now. And we thought it would be really lovely to send him off with a retrospection of his time here at Mount Vernon and all of the wonderful projects that he contributed to while he was here. So to start us off, Jim, can you tell us, you know, back when you first joined Mount Vernon, what what was it like? What was your first impression of this place walking into the library on the first day? As you know, uh, and as listeners probably remember, because I would probably talk about it more than I should have, but you know, I came out of a university setting. I finished my PhD at the University of Virginia in 2016, and then I did a two and a half or two and three quarter stint as a postdoctoral fellow in digital history at the University of Virginia Law Library, where I was working on legal history projects like reconstructing Thomas Jefferson's legal library for the University of Virginia, or at least helping with that effort, and leading up a larger transatlantic initiative on Scottish legal history, particularly the Scottish Court of Session Digital Archive, which is looking at how Scots and Americans and British subjects uh, negotiated and and came into legal combat with each other in in, uh, Scotland's Supreme Court of Session in the 18th century. So I've been doing a fair bit of, you know, digital work because that was my job. And, you know, I've been working the public history circuit in the sense that, you know, I was out there giving talks and things like that. And so I thought I had a good sense of what digital history was and is and its promise. And this was my first experience working at a sort of public history site in a professional paid capacity. The podcast was one of those components of that endeavor. I listened to podcasts quite a bit. And I knew that it was part of the job. But when I walked in in June of 2019 to this position, you know, I began hosting a few weeks later and I had some initial help with the editing, but then the folks who were helping me left. And so I had to figure out very quickly what the hell I was going to do and how to edit all this stuff. You know, it's remarkable because I also had a similar experience here where I came to work at Mount Vernon and then four months later, Jim and Buskey left. So, (laughs) yeah, it's really, it's just cycles of abuse here, Jim. I'm just paying it forward, is what I'm saying. But I'd love to hear about what it was like for you to be thrown into this podcasting world for the first time. Well, your hatred for me aside, Anne, you were much better positioned than I ever was to take on 
the kinds of duties that you did in my absence, uh, because you already came in with you know a lot of live stream experience, public history programming, and I had come out of a very sort of traditional you know academic background. As I said, I, I had been among the people, but not of them, I guess you might say. And so when I got thrown into the the podcast without much help, I was a little nervous, I guess would be the word, because I knew how to talk to people. I knew how to be on a mic. I knew how to, you know, from my extensive teaching background, I knew how to have conversations with people that could then help whoever's listening understand the history we're talking about. But the technical side was much more difficult. And I was in a little bit of a panic, truth be told. I didn't know how to do the editing. Throughout my entire career, I've worked in as part of a team particularly in the digital humanities. And so when I you know, came to Mount Vernon, I had the expectation of doing that. And there was a little bit of that, particularly after we poached Jeanette Patrick in early 2020. But really on the scale of the kind of teams I was working with, uh, we didn't have that in the CDH until the three of us at the very end of my tenure were on board. And so I was doing a lot of on-the-job training, trying to figure out Logic Pro, trying to understand how XLR cables connect to the soundboard and what different settings do to enhance audio quality, how to learn Audition. We were fortunate to be traveling for some of my previous work at the time that I started. So I had a mobile recorder that I took to Scotland that wasn't the best, but I did manage to capture some good interviews with Rachel Hosker and other folks when I was over there about early American stuff. But I learned the hard way that that recorder was not so great. And then I learned even harder how I had to use Adobe Edition to, to try to correct some of the deficiencies of that recording. And so I spent a lot of time on YouTube, a lot of time saying to myself, what have I gotten myself into and how am I going to pull this off? And a lot of time listening to other shows to identify things that I heard that I wanted conversations to sound like, both in terms of format, but also in terms of audio quality. And then the pandemic hit. Well, I would say, you know, like you had tremendous success. I mean, Intertwined was in the top 100 Apple podcasts. Conversations saw a huge boost during your tenure here. So it really seems like all of that, that study really came to fruition. Well, you, you all would know better than me. I just worked there. So Conversations did predate you, even if it won't post date you. Could you speak a little bit about the longer history of the show and also what your goals were when you took it on beyond just trying to figure out some of the technical aspects. Yes. The original incarnation of the show dated back, I don't know how long, 2015, 2013, somewhere around the libraries, the current libraries original founding. And it was initially a way for Doug Bradburn, who was then the founding director of the library, now president and CEO, to take advantage of the fact that the library was bringing in a lot of great scholars and wanting to talk with them about their work for the public's benefit and really create a space where scholars would feel comfortable coming in and talking about their work and reaching wider audiences. And Doug hosted it for a while. He then was, of course, elevated to the president and CEO of Mount Vernon, Joe Stoltz, who is our colleague there at the library who runs the leadership department, took it over for a while and he did some great stuff and really did a lot of good work emphasizing Mount Vernon as a place and also what goes on there. He was asked to take over the leadership division there at the library. Joe had actually been my predecessor as the person in charge of the Center for Digital History. So when Joe got elevated, Kevin Butterfield was hosting it for a little bit, but as the executive director of a much expanded library than you know what Doug had managed to build, you know Kevin just didn't have a whole lot of time, and so they made hosting the podcast part of the digital historian's position, which was my title throughout my reign there at Mount Vernon, and so I got got in the host chair. And when I took over the podcast, really my model was Liz Covart's Ben Franklin's World. I really appreciated the way that she was able to have really robust, intellectually stimulating conversations with scholars that were still publicly accessible. You know, for folks who don't know that show, a lot of the scholars that Liz talks to are not necessarily people who are writing for the public. They are writing really rigorously researched academic books that on the surface might be impenetrable. But really what she has been able to do is help scholars explain the significance of their work to a much wider audience. And I wanted to do that kind of the same way. I mean, there's no replicating Liz. I mean, she's already won. You know, she's she's Netflix of the history podcast world and there's no beating her. It's too late. 
But what I thought we could do at the library was kind of expand beyond sort of the Mount Vernon-centric, the Northern Virginia-centric framework that had evolved by the time that I took it on. And so I really wanted to expand the boundaries of what was possible. Sometimes, you know, I would go a little further afield because as, as you know, and as some listeners know, my interest is in Scotland and the American Revolution. So maybe there is a, a show about witch trials in Scotland in the 17th century. You know, what are you going to do? You know, captain's prerogative. But, you know, mainly trying to, to expand our audience's opportunity to learn from early American scholars, scholars of the early republic, so that they can better situate George Washington in his world, the enslaved populations in their world, and helping them see the complexity of the founding era in a much greater light. So, you know, with all of these fabulous conversations that you have had, what are some highlights from your time? What are some favorite interviews or moments? There are several. It's really hard to choose, but I'll, I, I wrote some down so I wouldn't forget. And some are because they were just really fun to have in you know, the conversations and some just because they were technically challenging podcasts to put together. But in terms of like the really fun side of things, Joanne Freeman remains one of my favorites. You know, her book on violence in Congress in the 19th century. And, and Joanne is, we're PhD siblings in the sense. We had the same advisor, but she finished a few years ahead of me. And Joanne is one of these people who is a joy to talk to, who really makes history fun, like as a person you aspire to be as a historian, both in terms of the rigor of her scholarship, but also her ability to connect with people with people. She's just a person who you can sit down and have a very easy conversation with. And we had a really productive one about violence in Congress. And it was a really kind of opportune conversation because of the political climate that we had found ourselves in by 2019, 2020. That was a really fun one. Speaking of, of Scotland, I interviewed my friend Mickey Brock, who is at Washington and Lee University. She is an expert on witchcraft and, and religion in 17th century Scotland. So we got to talk a lot about hunting Satan, how we did talk a lot about when her affinity for his dark majesty did uh, first emerge. And that was uh, you know back in her days in graduate school. And I learned that James I was, a, was an author of a book on demonology. Again, maybe a little bit outside the early republic, but it's all connected, right? Because, you know, they're still fearing witchcraft and, and whatnot in North America into the 18th century. So, you know, it counts. Billy Coleman was a really fun one. And Billy Coleman, Billy Coleman has written a book called Harnessing Harmony, which is about music and politics in the early republic. That clever guy and his music partner put together a soundtrack for the book in which they put together modern renditions of late 18th century, early 19th century favorites. Jefferson and Liberty is on there. Uh, there's a really cool take on the Star Spangled Banner that you can go listen to. It very kindly allowed us to sample some of those tracks in that episode, which was something I really wanted to do. As soon as I had heard that he was doing this, I was like, well, we've got to actually have that in the episode. That was part of my development in terms of audio editing was figuring out how to actually layer in music correctly in ways that it wasn't just the intro and outro, but like, you know, can I make it fade in really cool so that it's rising underneath us as we're talking about that. And so that was a really fun one. Probably the most technically challenging one that I did was with a scholar named Jose Emilio Yanis, who is a professor of veterinary science at the University of Salamanca in Spain. And he had written a book about everyone's favorite donkey, Royal Gift. And for those who don't know the story of Royal Gift, favorite donkey, he's the hero of all Mount Vernon livestock, except for Aladdin the camel. He's the mascot of the Center for Digital History. Yes, if you walk in, uh, sense Jim <laughs> as That is as well and truly appropriate. But that was really challenging because he first contacted me in my capacity as the editor of the Digital Encyclopedia of George Washington, in which he quite rightly said, you know, there's some things that aren't really right with your entry on Royal Gift. A complicating factor, though, is that Professor Yanis is, as we said, a Spaniard, and his English isn't that great. And my Spanish is passable, but not very good. And so we first started our journey together working on this encyclopedia article. And then I was like, you know what, let's get ambitious, because it's in the middle of COVID, like all bets are off. You know, you've got to find ways to make engaging content and reach audiences in this really weird time. I was like, well, let's do a podcast on this uh, particular book. And the book is really, you know, I can read a little bit of it. My, my reading Spanish is still good. And so it's a, it's a really good book. But I was going to need a translator 
because uh, we needed to have a conversation. Fortunately, one of his best friends grew up in Northern Virginia, lives in Spain, runs a school for English. And so he was able to act as our translator. So then I essentially what we did was, is I interviewed Jose. I would ask the question in English. Alan would translate into Spanish, receive the answer and translate back to English. So the real hero of this story is, is a guy named Alan who grew up in, in Northern Virginia. But then I had to figure out how to put it all together. And so that was a really technically challenged podcast because I had to figure out how I could ask my questions I wanted sort of that NPR journalistic quality where you start to hear the person answer in their native language and then layer in the translation on top of it. And so that was fun. And I think I recently pulled it off. It was pretty neat. The Spanish embassy seemed pretty happy with it because they picked it up. And then I was like, all right, we've got all this stuff. What if I just reverse order and actually make English language version and a Spanish language version? And then I did the introduction to that Spanish language one in Spanish, for which a lot of my friends make fun of me for how I say hola. And occasionally I'll get a text from a friend and it's just that sound clip of me saying hola because I sound like a complete idiot. But the but the recording came out and it actually seemed to work. And so that was those were some of the highlights. Another one would be Mike Duncan, you know, big time history podcaster. We got really lucky to interview him. He was very generous with his time and, and with his thoughts about how to be a good podcaster and so many others that we don't have time to mention, but was always grateful for anyone who had the, the willingness and the patience to talk with me on that show, including the two of you. You know, I, so I should say, though, I mean, one of the favorites is when I just could not hold it together with you, Ola, where we were talking about donaires. Of course. Nova Scotia. For food, the donaire. And I was debating, you know, that's the decisions you have to make as an editor. Do I leave that part in or do I take it out? Because, like, you, you don't, as a host, you don't want it to be about you. But it was just so funny objectively that I could not hold it together. I was like, I'm going to leave it in. I, you know, made the offer at the time and I, I make it again now. I'm happy to do an all donaire podcast with you at any point. Just let me know. I think. So this will be great. So we'll do a donair podcast where we're sampling those whilst drinking fine Scottish single malt whiskey. So Anne can participate as well. A fascinating taste sensation. <laughs> you know, though, I really don't feel like that mixes quite right. I disagree strongly, Anne. Only the finest will do. We need the, the smokiest, peatiest, most beautiful whiskeys to pair with the sweetened condensed milk glop sauce that we do place on our cuts of meat. Um, I will accept nothing less. I'm going to assume that's coming out of Jim's budget. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Position. Of yes, course. Yes. Yes, I would be happy to purchase a fine bottle of Lagavulin particularly the Nick Offerman version, so that we can sample it with the Canadian delicacy. I was specifically Atlantic Canadian. I want to make sure that the regional is, is respected. That's important. This might actually be a good pivot. Can you tell us a little bit about what you're working on now? Is it a Donair podcast? <laughs> Unfortunately, it's not a Donair podcast. Although, as we have both talked about, you both have very many good ideas that you should explore. I now work at R2 Studios, which is the podcast division at the Roy Rosenzweig Center for History and New Media at George Mason University. It was an exciting opportunity because I had long been sort of circling around the Rosenzweig Center. It's kind of one of the preeminent digital history sites in the country. I was very good friends with Abby Mullen, who was the initial head of the studio. And then Jeanette Patrick, who used to be our colleague at Mount Vernon, became head of the studio. And when an opportunity arose to go there, I wanted to jump at it because it was time to do something different. And, and, and in the case of the podcast space, wanting to see if what I had been doing at Mount Vernon with conversations and then intertwined. And then, you know, the projects that we had been spinning up by the time I left, like if I actually was good at this. And so now I've thrown all my chips in. And so at R2 Studios, we've got uh, several projects going on. So right now we are in season two of the Green Tunnel podcast, which is a history of the Appalachian Trail that is hosted by the Rosenzweig Center's executive director, Mills Kelly. It's a, a great show that explores the history, culture, and the environment of the Appalachian Trail from its founding in the 1920s through the present. We're working on some great stuff. We just had an episode about indigenous lands and the Native American presence on the AT. We had a really fun episode, which was actually my first one to edit, which is called Crapalation Trail, which is all about human waste and environmental concerns along the Appalachian Trail. And I will mention that last time we saw Jim in person, he did give us some great stickers related to this. You are quite welcome. It's from the heart, really. <laughs> <laughs>
We are collaborating with our colleagues Lincoln Mullen and John Turner on a history of American anti-Semitism that should be out sometime next year. Really important topic looking at the manifestations of anti-Semitism really from the colonial period through the present. And, And that's a difficult show to conceptualize and execute because there are so many different forms of anti-Semitism. The definition of anti-Semitism or what constitutes anti-Semitism changes over time. But it's a really great example of how we're able to use our skills as historians to unpack how these things emerge from roughly the 17th century through the 21st century. Different moments in time shape perceptions of Jewish people in the United States but also in turn uh, how Jewish people are able to find resilience you know, amidst anti-Semitism. So it's going to be a sobering and serious topic, and I think we're on the right track. We've had some productive meetings about it, and I, th- I think it'll be a really helpful show for the public, You know, particularly in light of the rise of anti-Semitism in popular culture more significantly in the last couple of years. But big thing I'm working on now, and actually we just conducted our first interview today, and it'll actually be announced today. Today is February the 16th, for those who are keeping count, is we're doing a new series on the American Revolution called Worlds Turned Upside Down. And and this is an idea I had had a while ago, but wasn't sure how to execute it because it didn't necessarily fit within the Mount Vernon mission. You know, if I was going to have to go it alone, I was going to, but I brought it to our two studios. And the thrust of the podcast is to tell the story of the American Revolution as an imperial crisis and civil war through the lives of the people who experienced it. And so a lot of scholars in the last few years have really focused on how people confronted the revolutionary moment, how they resisted it how they contested it, how they tried to stay out of its way. And I'm really interested in seeing it through their eyes, bringing that new scholarship to the public and helping people understand that the American Revolution wasn't simply just the founding of an independent republic, but it really was the first American Civil War. It was a moment when many white colonists in particular had to decide where their loyalties lie, and as a consequence of the choices that they made, what the future would look like for a whole host of people, including indigenous people, enslaved people, the entire period upends gender conventions and and whatnot. And so we're going to take kind of the political political framework that people knew that people know and then we're just going to pull it inside out and look at what people are doing in you know Nova Scotia what people are doing in London in the Caribbean what they're doing in Virginia how they are understanding the world that's evolving around them and so the first season will be out this summer late this summer I'm very excited about it it's it's a a project that I've been thinking about for a long time because originally it was going to be a book. But since it's taking me forever to write my other book, I thought, well, maybe it should be a podcast and maybe it can help R2 Studios really advance its mission to democratize history through podcasting. And so we'll see what happens. Get ready to have your world turns upside down fall 2023. You you know, we were going to ask what your dream project would be, but I think now it is very clear what it is. It's the Donaire podcast. But this uh, this revolutionary one sounds good too. It's well, the Donaire. I mean, there. I just I have to try one. Like, can we just make that happen, please? Yes. Next time I'm home, I am going to get some Donaire sauce, and I will bring it back with me. But we're gonna have a party. Yes, very excited for the World Turned Upside Down podcast, which I will be on. Is it appropriate? Can I say? Yes, we we can say it for the first time here. Dr. Alexander Montgomery will be one of the talking heads for this new series. Very excited for that opportunity. I think that's going to be a lot of fun. So we can continue, all, again, all jokes aside about you being dead to us, to have a productive relation, uh, working relationship and all these projects that we're all working on. I think so. And of course, Anne, not to, so you're not left out, we are going to get to the idea that you t- you and I had talked about eventually, but I won't say it here so no one scoops us. Yeah, there is there's a very exciting <laughs> idea. You know, Jim insists that he didn't hire me because of my shared interest in specialty in Scottish history, but we all know that was a lie. So (laughs) yeah, we have something very exciting planned for the future. (laughs) So stay tuned to both Washington Presidential Library and R2 Studios. So looking back at your three years at Mount Vernon, what was your proudest achievement here? I'll kind of mention two. One probably has to be, or one is, intertwined, the enslaved community at George Washington's Mount Vernon, which was the podcast, the scripted podcast that we did in 2021. There had been an idea to transform the Lives Bound Together exhibit into a podcast, and that project was handed to me and Jeanette Patrick in the Center for Digital History in late 2020, early 2021. And then we had to find a way to make it happen, because we weren't just content with 
replicating the exhibit. We wanted it to be its own thing. We wanted to take advantage of the fact that there had been new scholarship that had come out about Mount Vernon's enslaved community, including people like Mary Thompson had just published her book in 2019 on the only unavoidable subject of regret. And Bruce Ragsdale had just published Washington at the Plow. So there was some really exciting stuff that was informing the way that we re-understood both the Washingtons and slavery and enslavement, but more importantly, the enslaved community at Mount Vernon itself. The challenge was how to tell that story. And and what Jeanette and I settled on was telling it through the lives of eight individuals who experienced enslavement at Mount Vernon. But we didn't know how to write a narrative podcast. I mean, Jeanette had prior experience writing scripts for things. I had, as we've talked about, a lot of experience hosting a podcast and editing. But it's one thing to host an interview show and edit it. It's a much different animal to write a scripted series conduct, as we did, something like 23 interviews with leading scholars and members of the descendant community, and then cut all that together. We were very fortunate to work with Kurt Dahl of CD Squared, who helped us realize the vision that we had for the show. It did better than we ever expected. You know, when you when you do projects on slavery at public history sites, you are steal yourself for a lot of pushback for people who think that you shouldn't be talking about slavery, that somehow you're denigrating the founding fathers. The significance of that project is to help uh, educate the public about the fact that slavery and enslavement is much more complicated topic than I think we often allow, but that also there are real people behind the numbers you see tabulated on a list or sometimes not even named in a ledger. And if we could even do something to help bring those stories to the fore, then we had, I think, accomplished our mission. And I'm, I'm you know, quite proud of the fact that, that we did that. And, you know, as a consequence, I learned how to write a narrative history podcast, which I had not done before. And then the second one, and actually I'm not even sucking up, but really it's hiring the two of you, uh, truth be told. Aww. And I'm, I'm <laughs> being quite serious because I'm not that old, but I've been around the block enough that I find that people get complacent and they just decide to settle whoever they work or whoever they work with. And they're not interested in trying to work with people they want to work with. They just do it out of habit or routine. And, you know, fortunately, coming out of the UVA Law Library, I had worked with a team who, you know, were really good friends to this day because of our time together. And I wanted to try to create that in the CDH. We had started that process with Jeanette and COVID, you know, made things go haywire. But then we hired Ala as our postdoctoral fellow, now my usurper, and then, you know, of course, Anne in, in 2022. And I was trying to create a space where I wanted to go to work every day with the people I wanted to work with. But I've done anything good. It's it's the podcast and the opportunity to work with the two of you at, at Mount Vernon. So now is, I think, the part of the interview where we subject you to the same four questions you subjected all of your guests to over the years. How does it feel now, Dr. Ambusky? It does feel terrifying. You're in the hot seat now. Now is the winter of our discontent made glorious summer by these four questions. What book are you reading right now? Answer carefully because we will judge you. I'm actually reading Matthew DeGeek's The Fatal Land, which is about the Highland soldier and the Seven Years' War and the American Revolution. And it's in part to prepare for an interview that we've got coming up next week. But also, I'm a really big fan of, of Matthew's work. He is a Highlander himself. He writes and speaks Gaelic. And he does what I really admire people do is they use poetry very effectively as part of their scholarship. And I love poetry as a primary source. And even though, unfortunately, I don't read Gaelic or as much as I would like, the fact that he does it so well in his book, in and particularly in a military history, and showing the significance of oral culture and poetic culture to the culture of the Highlands in the 18th century is just remarkable. And so it's it's a lot of fun. Check it out from Yale University Press. Some real missed opportunities while we were both in the office together to do a little bit of Gallic study. Yes. Yeah, so although I'm hopefully if our if our plans come to fruition, there will mm. be opportunity to do so. Yeah. Stay tuned. 
from our two studios and the Washington Presidential Library. So who is the author you most admire? I've been really going back and forth on this, and I probably would go with Mark Twain, in part because, you know, I'd read Twain as a kid, but I got the opportunity to teach him under Liz Varon at the University of Virginia when I was in graduate school, and I taught Huckleberry Finn. I mean, of course, everybody knows that Twain is hilarious. He's a very funny writer, but he has an insight into American culture that I think few authors had, and particularly with that book, you know, one of the big criticisms is that he uses racial epithets quite liberally. And it's always been a criticism of that book. But then you start to understand why he does it. Part of what he's doing is he's writing a pre-Civil War story in the post-Civil War era. And he's pushing back against the idea that lost causers had started to espouse after the war, that racism didn't emerge until after the war. And that everything was just hunky-dory between white people and African Americans pre-war, but the destruction of the slave labor system really threw everything into chaos. It created racism, all this kind of stuff. Once I had really thought about that deeply and you know was able to teach that, I thought, My, that guy's a lot smarter than I will ever be and a lot cleverer and subtler in pushing back against arguments that you know, post-Civil War Southerners are making about quote-unquote idyllic life of the South in the pre-war period and using literature in a very humorous way, but also a very serious way to contest those ideas. So I try to inject both humor in my work, but also... You know, I'll never write anything as significant as what he did. Put subsurface things in there that are trying to make a larger point. That is an excellent answer on the importance of literature to understanding history. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> to pivot from secondary sources and literary sources to primary works, what is the most exciting thing that you've ever found in your research? There are two, and they're both connected to my time as a Georgian Papers Program Fellow with the Omohundra Institute of Early American History and Cultures. At a very low point in my graduate career in 2015, when I did not get two jobs that I was a finalist for, I get an email from Karen Wolf saying that I had won a fellowship that I had applied for to go study in the Royal Archives at Windsor Castle in England. Now, of course, as a graduate student, to be able to go to Windsor Castle and literally rummage in the papers of George III was not only a highlight of my entire graduate career, but remains a highlight of my entire professional life. It so happened that I was the first person to go in as part of this program. So I was kind of the guinea pig. You know, I was I was the scouts, uh, the army, the American army coming over to look through the king's stuff. And I found two things that I did not expect. And the, and the, the thing that listeners should know about George III's papers is a lot of them had been transcribed and published in the early 20th century. But about 20% of them had not. And in some of the stuff that had not been published but were known about, there were assumptions about those documents that were incorrect. And so the first one I'll talk about is the King's famous essay on the loss of America. And so he allegedly writes in 83 or 84, a brief couple of paragraphs lamenting the loss of the American colonies. Where does Britain go from here? What do we do? And it was always assumed that this was George III's ruminations on losing the empire. And we knew that he had been thinking about this. He even thought about, you know, abdicating the throne because he felt like he had failed as uh, the great father of the empire. And so it was believed that this snippet of paper was him writing down his thoughts on the loss of America. But it turns out that's not right. Through the magic of full text search while I was there, and by full text search, I mean Googling and Google Books, I came across that same passage in an author admired both by George III and George Washington, Arthur Young. In about 1784, Young begins to publish a journal called The Annals of Agriculture, which is about, you guessed it, agriculture. And this is a period in which people like Young are thinking seriously about how to use land more effectively for agricultural production in England. And this is something that George III is intensely interested in, as is George Washington in the New Republic. And in the first essay of that first volume is that passage on the loss of America. And what Young is arguing is that Great Britain should give up the idea of territorial empire. It costs too much that really you should focus on free trading relationships, things like that. He's very much in step with the Earl of Shelburne, who was one of the British ministers who helped to negotiate the final peace as prime minister in the 1780s between the United States and Great Britain. So there's this emerging free trading ideology centered around agriculture and production and things like that. Young is involved in this. 
And the king reads that essay and it extracts it. And it had been thought that that was the king's original thoughts. I mean, Andrew O'Shaughnessy, our colleague uh, formerly at Monticello, was always perplexed why suddenly George III, who is 100% behind crushing the rebellion and only gives up at the last moment because he basically has no other choice, seemingly does a U-turn. And lo and behold, it's not actually the king's thoughts. It comes from Arthur Young. So I figured that out and I sent an email to the archivist, or actually I think I called him over and I was like, hey, Oliver, uh, Oliver Walton, who was the archivist at the time, one of the program directors, I was like, hey, look what I found. <laughs> and it was a, a small contribution to helping us rethink George III's attitudes towards the United States at the end of the war. So that was really exciting for a moment for me. The other exciting moment came a few weeks later because I, I was really fortunate to be there for a month. When I came a, a, across a collection of papers from Admiral Sir Samuel Hood, who was one of the commanding officers at the Battle of Capes, which was set up at the Battle of Yorktown in 1781. He served in the Caribbean. 150 letters that he is sending to a man named Jacob de Boud, who is George III's aide-de-camp, which the letters had really not been known about and all kinds of marvelous material, starting with Hood's deployment to North America during the Revolution and running all the way through it into the 1782-83, when the British and the French were contesting the Caribbean in one of the last sort of major naval combat operations of the war. All these letters being sent to the King's ADC. So why is he doing that? And Hood, if you know anything about him or read him, is a very florid writer. He is a man who once his contribution to be known to history and, more importantly, to his superiors. And it kind of occurred to me, and I wrote an essay about this for the Georgian Papers Program website, that he's probably using Daboud to try to back-channel to the king, to ensure that the king is aware of that he would have done differently uh, at the Battle of the Chesapeake Bay. When Admiral Graves is doing this, he would have done this, and maybe they would have saved Cornwallis's army and not led to such a complete, unmitigated disaster in October of 1781. Just this very rich, remarkable correspondence in which it's very clear that Hood has an objective. Now, he's sending similar letters to other people, but to the person who is the king's aide-de-camp, that's pretty significant. That was a really remarkable find. And all those letters have been transcribed as part of the transcription program associated with the project. So if people go to the Georgian Papers Program site, they can read those documents and see what Hood is doing. And then finally, how do you hope that people will remember your work? As useful. I think that's as most as any of us can really ask. Useful, and actually I like Sarah Giorgini's answer, who was my last guest on Conversations, and her answer was, as a beginning. And so if I could have my work be useful, but then also as a jumping off point for others, then perhaps I've done something worthwhile. Well, you've certainly produced a lot of useful and wonderful materials during your time here at Mount Vernon. And you are sorely missed. We do joke that you are dead, but... It is only because your absence has left such a vacuum. Yes, and we are very excited to see the things that you are now doing at our two studios, and I'm sure our listeners will be as well. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to have a final soiree and look forward to seeing all the kind of crazy stuff that you're getting up to, which is actually equally great, and probably as a consequence of me giving you permission to do it. <laughs> <laughs> there you have it, folks. Jim Ambusky taking credit from beyond the... <laughs> Well, Tim, uh, to end us off, uh, where can our listeners go if they want to hear more great productions by Jim and Busky? There are several places where you can find me. Uh, Twitter is still alive, uh, evidently. So you can still find me at James P. Ambusky on Twitter. I wasn't smart enough back in the day to claim at Jim Ambusky, so you have to have my full professional name, equally jamespmbuskey.com, where you can learn a little bit more about me and some things I'm up to and things that I've done. And then most importantly, r2studios.org, which is the website for our studio at George Mason University, where you can find all of the shows that are currently available and those that are coming down to your earbuds soon. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for joining yes, us, Jim. Yes, thank you, Jim. This has been a wonderful and very complimentary conversation. Yes, I'm not mad about some of the things you said. Well, it's been a while now since I've left, so I think the anger has dissipated and we can sort of, we've, we've come to the acceptance phase. Thank you, Jim, for joining us today. And to all our listeners out there, you haven't heard the last of the George Washington Podcast Network yet. 
We'll be releasing a new scripted podcast called Inventing the Presidency by the end of 2023. But keep listening for a sneak peek of our next podcast, The Secrets of Washington's Archives, releasing in June 2023. Through conversations with library staff, we get up close and personal with the books owned by George Washington that are held here at the George Washington Presidential Library. Inside these books are hidden stories that reveal the rich and untold inner life of Washington and his family. It's June 25th, 1788. George Washington writes to Philadelphia printer Matthew Carey that, I entertain a high idea of the utility of periodical publications. I consider such easy vehicles of knowledge more happily calculated than any other to preserve the liberty, stimulate the industry, and meliorate the morals of an enlightened and free people. Washington subscribes to nearly two dozen newspapers and magazines in his lifetime. Not only is he buying them for himself, but he is also sharing them with his friends and family. Today, on The Secrets of Washington's Archives, we're sharing the unusual journey of The Bee and Literary Intelligencer, a magazine that Washington supports from its earliest days. We'll follow The Bee from its origins in Scotland an enthusiastic reception by President Washington, right up to its mysterious disappearance and miraculous reappearance nearly 100 years later. And now your host, Dr. Ann Fertig. Welcome to Secrets of Washington's Archives, a special podcast celebrating the 10th anniversary of the Washington Presidential Library at George Washington's Mount Vernon. Today, we're introducing you to the fascinating story of The Bee and Literary Intelligencer, a magazine that Washington owned, that he lost, and that he supported the production of. So there's a lot to say about this particular book in question. With me today is Samantha Snyder, research librarian here at the library. In addition to knowing everything, Samantha is our resident expert on Elizabeth Powell, who was an influential early Philadelphia woman who plays an important role in today's story. So welcome so much, Samantha, for joining us. Just to start us off, can you tell me what you do here as research librarian? Yes. Well, thank you so much for having me here today, Anne. As research librarian, I basically oversee all of the incoming research inquiries and scholarship that comes through Mount Vernon. So I handle research requests from the public, from staff members, from our research fellows, which I also manage that program, which are different people we pay to come do research here and write books and articles and things like that. But then I also just fill my brain with a lot of knowledge. I have learned more about George Washington and early America than I ever would have expected. And I'm not joking. Sam knows a lot. She is an expert on many, many subjects. Many a scholar is indebted to her knowledge of the Washingtons and of society in early America. So thank you so much, Sam, for joining us. We're talking today about a periodical and it's called The Bee in Literary Intelligence, or we'll just call it The Bee. And that is B-E-E, just mm-hmm. like the insect. <laughs> so to start us off, I thought it'd be really cool to talk about George Washington's relationship with periodicals, because he was a big reader of newspapers and magazines, wasn't he? Yes, he definitely was. He loved periodicals. He loved newspapers, especially. He subscribed to many, many papers. And there's documentation of him reading the papers, reading them out loud, and normally after dinner. But he had quite a host of periodicals, all sorts of types. So historical, scientific, everything. To give you an idea of what periodical culture was like in this period, periodicals were pretty much the cheapest literature you could get. And because of that, they were very widely read, 
we start seeing around the 1780s and 1790s in particular just a boom of new periodicals. And Washington subscribed to many of them. It's actually really hard to count, (laughs) one, how many there were in the United States at the time, but two, Washington was subscribing to so many as well. And sometimes the print runs were so short on some of these, or they'd change titles, they'd go in and out. Like the bee only was in existence for three years. It's a tough business to succeed in, Mm -hmm. to be able to produce these cheaply and then to make a profit on them. And so they were printed on very cheap paper with very cheap ink, would often run. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's actually a miracle any have survived to this day. I'm always amazed in the archive when I can see an original print copy of a newspaper or a periodical. And then there were things like the Bee, which were actually magazines, but not mm-hmm. magazines as we would imagine them today. So unlike the newspapers, which were on broadsides and folded up, magazines could be bound, even if they were bound cheaply. And many people, including Washington himself, often chose to preserve their magazines by getting them formally bound with the boards and leather covers. So Washington valued his periodicals so much that he would preserve them forever, which is why we actually have so many of what we as scholars and as librarians would call ephemera. Mm -hmm. And ephemera is those publications that aren't meant to last your newspapers your pamphlets your calling cards anything made of paper that is really just meant to be a temporary little thing but Mm -hmm. so much of his survives because he actually took pains to bind them and store them in his library which is very cool and even some of his older magazines, he subscribed to the London Magazine at one point, the Gentleman's Magazine, I believe, and those date back to the 1760s. He was binding those. And he's also yeah. subscribing to a lot of American periodicals Mm -hmm. as well. And he was such a supporter of these periodicals that when it came to give his farewell address, and that is the speech that he gave when he left the second term of his office, he could have given this speech to Congress in a very private way, but he actually chose to publish it in the newspapers because he wanted it to go out to the people. And this has been used by scholars like Kevin Hayes as evidence of his support of the press. To him, he saw these cheap, easily available vehicles of knowledge as the way to be able to reach out to the people of the United States most directly. And a funny story about that farewell address, it was originally too long (laughs) for the newspapers. So yeah, Hamilton was forced, (laughs) Hamilton wrote it and he was forced to cut it down significantly. But it is considered to be one of Washington's finest speeches. Mm -hmm. So just to give you an idea of some of the periodicals that George Washington subscribed to, they included the Gazette of the United States sold by John Fenno. He was a big fan of Claypool's periodicals, of which there were several, one being the Pennsylvania Packet and Daily Advertiser, another being Claypool's own advertiser. He subscribed to one called the Congressional Register. He subscribed to the Boston Columbia Sentinel. He subscribed to the New York Daily Advertiser. You could tell he's getting them from all over the country. Yep, exactly. And we also have sometimes really interesting little mention in his account books of ones we can't trace. But there's one referred to as a Dutch newspaper, which is very interesting because Washington did not speak Dutch. Mm -hmm. And it may have been ordered for a member of his household or for some other purpose that we don't know. But there are mentions in there of other newspapers that we can't quite trace. And so all in all, in my research, I have found mentions of 22 different periodicals that he was subscribed to at different points. Mm -hmm. I'm fairly certain there are more out there. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really interesting that we actually have a record from his secretary, Tobias Lear, who wrote that the night before Washington died, he read the newspaper Mm -hmm. with Lear. Mm -hmm. And this is a quote from Lear's account, quote, he was very cheerful. And when he met with anything interesting or entertaining, he read it aloud as well as his hoarseness would permit him. So sad. (laughs) It is. 
You know, he he was obviously ill, but he was still yeah, reading aloud exactly. his papers with gusto. And this was a lifelong love he mm-hmm. had. If we look back through his letters, in 1788, he said to printer Matthew Carey that he, quote, entertains a high idea of the utility of uh, periodical publications. I consider such easy vehicles of knowledge more happily calculated than any other. So why would that be? Why is he so interested in periodicals like newspapers and like the Bee? Well, I think because... In the 18th century, that was how people got all sorts of news and did all sorts of research because you're seeing things coming from all over the world. And in something like the bee, it's a miscellany. So there's even more of a variety. So you're getting poetry, you're getting articles, you're getting scientific things, politics. And I think Washington was such a voracious learner and reader that he would be drawn to stuff like that. And that was how people got their news. And if they were interested in poetry, they could pick up a periodical they could pick up a magazine and science and all sorts of things so that's really interesting you said that the bee is a miscellany can you talk about what that might mean a miscellany would be just that a compilation of all sorts of pieces so things on science politics poetry essays book reviews anything and everything in the volume that we're talking about there's even that article on a rhinoceros a rhinoceros Mm -hmm. with an engraving and everything showing what it looked like and we know that from his presidential account books washington loved seeing animals he did because he's so interested in animals he might have really enjoyed reading about the rhinoceros in the bee Yes, exactly. And I think there was no Wikipedia or Google News or BuzzFeed or any of those sort of things where you're getting that constant flow of all types of information. So these things would have been just that. Well, that brings up a good point because a lot of those articles are short and easy to digest. And that's Mm -hmm. what the B is as well. These are short articles. Sometimes they're extracts of longer pieces. They're easy to digest for the president on the go. Yes. (laughs) He was extraordinarily busy, too, so we can see why that would have been of use to him, especially during his presidency, which is, I believe, when The Bee was originally published. So let's talk about the history of this particular periodical, The Bee, and Washington's involvement with it. Washington was originally sent the these books in 1792 by the creator of the bee, a man named James Anderson. And James Anderson had a benefactor, the Earl of Buchan, who corresponded with Washington. And through the Earl of Buchan, he sent copies of the bee to George Washington and Thomas Jefferson. And originally, he actually sent his prospectus, which is his plan of what's to come. Yes. And he sent it to Jefferson, and Jefferson thanked him and said, This looks very good. Thank you. Have a good day. And he sent it to Washington. And Washington was a little bit more effusive and wholeheartedly supported. Very excited. Yes. In 1792, when the periodicals published, he and his benefactor have it bound. And Anderson sends him the first four volumes. And then the Earl of Buchan sends an additional six volumes of the Bee. And this starts off one of my favorite lines of correspondence because Washington sends a letter thanking both of them effusively and saying, I want to be a subscriber. I want to pay for this book. Mm -hmm. In other words, he wants to support it financially. And they refuse. (laughs) They're like, no, it's a gift, George. And he sends him another letter and he says, I want to reiterate, I want to be a subscriber. And once again, it doesn't go anywhere. And I believe it takes about four letters until George is about, I am sending you money if it is too much. Send me the change. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Which is wonderful because he not only supported the periodical business, but he saw the use of a periodical like a bee, which was meant for tradespeople. It's meant for business people. It's meant for people in agriculture. Mm -hmm. And he wanted to support it financially, which is really lovely to see. But what you're here to tell us today is an even more intriguing story about Washington's network of readers Mm -hmm. and a letter we have from one Elizabeth Powell. If you want to learn more about the mysterious disappearing bee or any of the other treasures of Washington's library, be sure to check out The Secrets of Washington's Archives, available from your favorite podcast website in June 2023. 
To learn more about our exciting future podcasts, be sure to check out georgewashingtonpodcast.com. Thanks for joining us today on Conversations at the Washington Library, a production of the Center for Digital History at the Washington Presidential Library. I'm Dr. Ann Furtick, your host and producer, and today I was joined by my co-host, Dr. Alexandra Montgomery, and our guest, Dr. James M. Buskey. Our music is Witch's Brew by C.K. Martin. <laughs>